Greetings and welcome back to Mavanwinia Studio here in Leitrim's Iron Mountain. My name is Harriet and today I will be sharing another short watercolour time lapse in my sketchbook. Today's painting is another mermaid because we are on day four into mermaid and the prompt list that I am following is by Erica Joy here on YouTube and I will leave a link below the video to her channel if you want to check out Erica's artwork and I'll also leave a link to her Instagram post with the prompt list if you'd like to join in for the rest of the month. Today is day four and the prompt was Rose. So I started the sketch a little differently from previous days and I used a colouring pencil that was non-water soluble to define the line work. I do believe this made me stay in the lines more. I didn't wash the sketch out as I would usually do. I followed the line and tried to be much more neat and tidy because I think the last few days my painting got a bit messy, a bit muddy in places and overworked. I'm not saying I didn't overwork this one because I'm still not completely at peace with the way I'm making these but every day I'm learning a little bit more about different ways of approaching things and I think that's really the beauty of doing a daily art challenge because every day you just push yourself further and you build on that skill level and knowledge that you've acquired for the coming days. In the spirit of Mermaid, I would like to read the first part of Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid. And I think that this is a beautiful piece of writing and it's very descriptive of their underwater world. So I think it's very inspiring for any of you who are doing Mermaid if you haven't heard the original. So today I'm going to read just the first part of the story. The Little Mermaid. Far out at sea, the water is as blue as the petals of the loveliest cornflower, and it is clear as pure glass, but it is very deep, deeper than any anchor cable can reach. Many church towers would have been placed on top of each other and stretched from the seabed down to the surface. Down there the sea folk live. Do not believe, though, there is nothing but bare white sand on the seabed. No. The most marvellous trees and plants grow there and have such pliant trunks, stems and leaves. The slightest movement of the water causes them to move as if they were alive. All the fishes, great and small, slip between their branches just as birds up here do in the air. At the very deepest spot lies the Sea King's palace. The walls are of coral and tall pointed windows of the clearest amber. The roof is made of mussel shells that open and close as the water passes. It looks so lovely, for each of them lie a gleaming pearl. A single one would be a prized gem in any queen's crown. For many years, the sea king down there had been a widower, but his old mother kept house for him, for she was a wise woman, but proud of her high birth so she always wore twelve oysters on her tail, while all the other fine folk were only allowed to wear six. Otherwise, she deserved much praise, especially because she was fond of the small sea princesses, the daughters of her son. They were six lovely children, but the youngest one was the most beautiful of them all. Her skin was clear and delicate as a rose petal, her eyes as blue as the deepest sea, but like the rest of them, she had no feet. Her body ended in a fish's tail, and all day long they could spend playing down in the palace, in the great halls where the flowers grew out of the walls, the great amber windows opened, and the fishes would swim into them, just as swallows would fly into us when we open our windows. But the fishes swam right up to the small princesses and ate out of their hands, and they let themselves be stroked. Outside the palace there was a large garden with bright red and dark blue trees with fruit that shone like gold and flowers that blazed like fire. 
In the constantly moving stems and leaves, the earth itself was of the fine, pure sand, but blue as the flare of sulphur. There lay a mysterious blue sheen over everything down there. It would be easier to believe that one was high in the air and could only see the sky above and beneath the one that was down there on the seabed. When the sea was calm, one could make out the sun. It seemed to be a purple flower with its entire light streaming out of the calyx. Each of the small princesses had their own plot in the garden, where she could dig and sow as she wanted. One gave her flower plot, a form of a whale. Another preferred hers to look like a little mermaid. But the youngest princess made hers completely round like the sun, and only had flowers that shone red like it did. She was a strange child, quiet and thoughtful. And while the other sisters added the most remarkable things that they had taken from stranded ships as decoration, all she wanted to have, apart from the rose-red flowers that resembled the sun, was a beautiful marble statue. It was a fine-looking lad, carved out of clear white stone, and left on the seabed after a ship had floundered. At its base, she planted a rose-red willow. It grew splendidly and hung with its fresh branches over the statue, down towards the blue seabed, where its shadows appeared to be violet in its motion. Just like the branches, it looked as if the treetop and roots pretended to be kissing each other. Nothing made her happier than to hear about the human world above them. The old grandmother had a tale to tell them all about the ships and the cities, people and animals. And what seemed especially delightful to her was that up on the earth the flowers had a scent, for they did not down at the seabed, and that the forests were green and the fish could be seen amongst their branches and could sing too. So loudly and sweetly it gladdened the heart. It was for the small birds that the grandmother called fish, for otherwise her sisters would not be able to understand her, as they had never seen a bird. When you complete your fifteenth year, the grandmother said, you will be allowed to rise up into the sea and sit in the moonlight on the rocks and watch the big ships that sail past. You will see forests and cities. During the following year, one of the sisters turned 15, but the others, well, each one was a year younger than the other. So the youngest had no less than five years to wait before she would venture to come up from the seabed to see how things are in our world. Each one promised the other to relate what she had seen and found the most delight on their first day, for their grandmother did not tell them enough. There was so much they wanted to know about. None was as full as longing as the youngest one, the very princess who had the longest time to wait, who was so quiet and thoughtful. Many a night she would stand at the open window and gaze up through the dark blue water, where the fishes swished their fins and tails. She could see the moon and the stars, their gleam was admittedly somewhat pale, but through the waters they looked much larger than they do to our eyes. If what looked like a black cloud passed beneath them, she knew it was either a whale swimming above her, or possibly a ship with many people on board. They certainly did not think that there'd be a lovely mermaid standing below, stretching up her white hands towards the keel. I just think the language in that is very lovely and inspiring. On reading it, it really took me into that mermaid world so hopefully you find that a little bit inspiring and perhaps in a later video I will read the next part. So we are coming to the end of my time lapse now and if you've made it this far <laughs> thank you so much for watching. If you're taking part in mermaid do let me know where I can see all your mermaid artwork. Do stay safe and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Bye bye!